Okay, so we're starting with part four of uh, <clears throat> passing your helicopter check ride uh, in a Robinson R44. And the next subject that we're going to cover is uh, the requirements and procedures for obtaining a special flight permit, also known as a ferry permit. If you call it a special flight permit, most people aren't going to know what the hell you're talking about. So it actually kind of goes by the more common uh, name of a ferry permit. And uh, again, for those of you that like to cite FARs, this will be FAR 21.197, 21.197. And if you read that FAR, you'll see that a special uh, flight permit can be obtained for an aircraft that doesn't quite meet the airworthiness requirements, but is still, sta still safe for flight. And it gives about five different examples of when you could do that. Number one, uh, <clears throat> of the uh, five examples, number one is the one that you're most likely to encounter uh, with uh, as a private or commercial pilot and that being being able to move the aircraft when uh, repairs are necessary and to give you an example of that say that your annual you thought your annual was out this month and then lo and behold you find out that your annual actually expired uh, the last uh, during at uh, the end of last month and you now need to move the aircraft you don't have a mechanic available at point let's say point a where you're at and you need to move the aircraft to point b to have the uh, aircraft uh, repaired, alterations or repairs done. Okay, so what you need to know about this is that you would obtain the special flight permit or the ferry permit from the FISDO where the aircraft, the, the geographic area where the aircraft is sitting, that determines which FISDO is gonna issue the ferry permit, all right? And uh, it's a, a matter of a combination of faxing and emailing the FISDO, you can probably call them on the phone, these days it's kind of hard to get anybody to answer the phone because of COVID, they generally leave a message, they call you back. But basically how the process works is <clears throat> you contact the FISDO and then through a, either email or faxing or a combination of the two, they will end up sending you the special uh, flight permit or ferry permit. It has to be signed off by at least an A and P typically, and not, you don't have to be uh, an IA, but just an A and P can sign it off. and. Um, so what are some of the questions that are going to ask you about special flight permits? Well, number one, uh, usually the examiner will say, okay, you've got uh, your annual ran out last month and you're taking this uh, aircraft from point A to point B. Um, who all can go, who all can accompany you on the flight? Well, it's just required crew members. And that typically for a R-22, R-44, R-66, that's going to be you only, just the pilot in command to be on board the aircraft for the flight. It's approved for a flight from point A to point B. You're not supposed to be, you know, if you're leaving out of Cape Dorado here going, or, you know, going from Paducah to Cape Dorado, you're not allowed to go through Chicago on the way down here. You just have to be from traveling from point A to point B for the purpose of obtaining the maintenance. All right. And that's really about all you need to know about it. And it needs to be issued by the FISDO where the aircraft is, is sitting, where it's actually going to be departing from. And then uh, typically they'll have an, uh, an A&P has to sign off on the, and they will issue the ferry permit. They'll generally fax it to you. You take it along with you on board the aircraft. And uh, really that's basically the highlights of that. And you can read more. If you want to know more in depth, again, you can reference uh, 21.197 and uh, read all about the ferry permits there. Okay, so how do you determine which FISDO that the aircraft's actually sitting in? Uh, <clears throat> quite simple actually just go on the internet and you can do it on your phone you can do it on a uh, laptop and just do a search for FISDO maps or FSDO it stands for flight standards district office which is basically your local FAA office just do a search for FISDO maps and uh, you'll and pretty quickly be able to figure it out here I'll show you an example this is the state of Missouri and if you look at the state of Missouri on the eastern side here this is the St. Louis FISDO uh, which uh, also goes over into Illinois just a bit, just to the east of St. Louis. If you were to look, uh, we'll click on to the next one, I'll show you the example of the Kansas City uh, FISDO. So here's the Kansas City FISDO, and it's the, basically the western side of Missouri, and just a little bit of Kansas here as well. So, again, <clears throat> pretty quickly you can uh, do a search for FISDO maps, uh, take a look and, and uh, pretty quickly figure out exactly uh, which FISDO the aircraft is sitting in. You can do another search for FISDO contacts and uh, 
come up with the phone number to whichever FISDO you're having to deal with um, in a matter of just a, a minute or so on the internet. Okay, so the next subject we're going to discuss is airworthiness directives. And uh, <clears throat> it's asking you to, uh, concerning locating and explaining airworthiness directives. So an airworthiness directive, number one, is issued by the FAA. And the biggest thing you have to understand about a, an AD note, a lot of times these are called AD notes or airworthiness directives, they are mandatory. The compliance with these are is mandatory, all right? So to find, <clears throat> let's say you have an aircraft um, that you're wanting to go purchase and you're going to go pick this aircraft up and you want to see if all the AD notes have been uh, complied with. It's a lot of work. You actually, there's a search engine on the FAA's website, and I'll show you that here in just a second. But you literally have to search for that particular aircraft by manufacturer, and then print out all the AD notes, and sit down, take out the log books, and then go through the log books and see if any of the uh, AD notes actually apply. And you go through one at a time to make sure that if they do apply the aircraft, the, the uh, AD note has been complied with, all right? Okay, so let's look at uh, what page you're going to go to to find the actual AD note. Again, if you go to the FAA's website and do a search for airworthiness directives and then put in current only and hit search, you'll come up with this page right here. All right? So down here, if you look in about the center of the page, it says manufacturer or AD number. So if you just click on that, let's say we're going to look for a particular Robinson helicopter. So we just type in Robinson. And we hit search. All right, so now it's going to bring up all the possible AD notes on Robinson helicopters. All right, and you'll notice that the AD notes start off with the year that they were issued, 2000 13 51. So you just have to go through here and, and uh, try to determine which of the AD notes apply. I mean, you can click on the easiest way to do it is just to click on it like this, and then you can actually bring up the emergency. AD note and read over it and see if it applies to the aircraft that you're wanting to purchase. All right. So now <clears throat> this probably sounds like a lot of work and guess what? It is a lot of work. All right. So to try to figure out which AD notes um, that are going to be applied to the aircraft that you're wanting to purchase, now it takes a lot of work. You got to compare, you got to get the, the log books out, the maintenance logs, and look up all of the possible AD notes by manufacturer and then, you know, do your homework. Get them out and figure out which one which one is which. So now, let's get back to uh, passing your check ride. So what are they going to want you to know about, air, uh, about uh, airworthiness directives or AD notes? The most important thing you need to know about an AD note is that it is mandatory compliance, right? You have to comply with the AD note. Sort of in a similar fashion, uh, manufacturers will actually, not the FAA, but manufacturers will issue service bulletins. And that can be uh, you know, such thing as uh, you know, using a different type of uh, lubricant on, uh, in the engine or whatever. And service bulletins don't carry the same weight as an AD note. AD note is, again, mandatory compliance issued by the FAA. Service bulletins are issued by the manufacturer of a certain piece of equipment on board the aircraft. And if you don't comply with the service bulletin, generally it voids your warranty. That's about the biggest risk that you take in not complying with the service bulletin. Okay, and the other thing you probably need to be aware of is that AD notes can be issued, or airworthiness directives, can be issued for uh, more than just uh, replacing a nut or a bolt on the aircraft or replacing a particular component or changing to a different lubricant or whatever, they can actually be issued for uh, operational uh, procedures with the aircraft. And one, if you're going to fly a Robinson helicopter, the one that you really need to be aware of is concerns the Robinson R-22, and it's AD note number, uh, I believe it's 95-26-04. And in a nutshell, what that uh, AD note had, uh, what it dealt with is that they had to modify the POH and it had to do with operating the aircraft in relatively high winds. And so the AD note basically said that unless you had 200 hours total time uh, helicopter 
and more than 50 hours Robinson R-22 time, then you cannot operate the aircraft with surface winds exceeding, I believe, 25 knots. Could be no more of a gust spread than 15 knots. In other words, uh, the winds were eight knots gusting to 24. Now that would be a 16 knot spread that would exceed 15 and you're not supposed to be operating the aircraft until you have 200 hours total time and greater than 15 in R-22. And I think continued flight into moderate and severe turbulence was also cited in the AD note. But just be aware that AD notes can be issued, and again, these things are mandatory compliant. So if you're flying an R-22 until you had the requisite 200 hours and uh, total time helicopter and 50 in an R-22, not supposed to be flying uh, the aircraft in uh, those high wind conditions mentioned in the AD note. Okay, so that brings us to the end of uh, part four, and we'll continue this on in part five. And again, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. And we'll see you guys in uh, part five.